attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, this is Christine Pere, and welcome to the Area Research Committee webinar. Um, today's webinar is on the subject of light anchors and the exciting research being done at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm delighted to have with us today one of the PhD candidates in the Future Interfaces group. So we'll be learning more about what that group does, some of the other projects, and then focusing down um, specifically into Karan's project. Um, so, sorry about that. I had a, a... And then after Karan's presentation, then we'll be able to take your questions. Now, all participants are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions, please use the questions uh, compartment in your GoToWebinar control panel, and then we'll take those at the end. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, the area, for those of you who may not be familiar with us already, is a, um, an, an alliance with the goal of building up and supporting an expanding ecosystem for enterprise augmented reality. The center or at the top of this pyramid for our ecosystem figure are the large enterprises or enterprises of all sizes that are interested in using augmented reality to improve their performance, to comply with regulations, and uh, also cut down on errors and, and time to finish tasks and many other benefits from enterprise augmented reality. Supporting those customers are the providers of technologies, um, those who supply, develop and supply uh, services, software, hardware uh, to those large enterprises. And in collaboration with the providers who also do a lot of research internally, we have non-commercial entities that are part of the area. These can be uh, universities, research institutes, sometimes standards development organizations um, that are working together uh, to do research and, and develop new technologies. So those are the three large compartments of our ecosystem and who we support and work with, who are our members. So we help them work together by providing uh, thought leadership content such as this webinar, but many other um, formats and types of content that are usually available through our website. We also participate in lots of third-party events and organize our own events uh, to help our members and the larger community of AR professionals to network, find one another, and um, benefit from the experiences of, of those who have gone ahead, been through the trenches. <laughs> We're also interested in supporting um, the development of professionals that have skills in enterprise augmented reality. We want to do that in partnerships with educational universities and, and programs of all types that will uh, certify, will develop the skills in and then certify uh, AR professionals that then can be hired uh, in, in uh, companies to do this kind of um, deployments, implementations, and to integrate and maintain augmented reality. Since many of our members are able to describe their, um, their challenges, uh, we've organized ourselves into committees to reduce the barriers to adoptions. And this committee, the research committee, is one of those, uh, but there also are committees on the subject of security, uh, requirements, safety. We also have a human factors interest group that's very active. And we encourage uh, people to learn more about those and to help reduce the barriers to adoption of AR. So that's my uh, introduction, brief introduction to the area. And now I'd like to invite our guest speaker today. Um, his name is Karan Ahuja. And Karan, I've just made you the uh, presenter. Can you um, confirm that you can see that? Uh, yes, yes, we can. Thanks for the great introduction. Let me do that. Okay. Oh. Okay, great. Well, so um, give Your me a slides second. are very clear. I see them on my screen. Thank you. Okay. 
Hello everyone, I am Karan Ahuja. I'm a third year PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University. Today I'm going to be talking to you about linking virtual content with physical objects and locations. Before we jump right into it, let me give you a background of myself and the group I belong to. I'm part of a lab called the Feature Interfaces Group, led by Chris Harrison. A part of what we do at our lab is to create novel sensing and interface technologies to create powerful and delightful human-computer interactions. These efforts often lie in emerging use modalities, such as wearable computing. So in this example, you can see a smartwatch which has been extended with the mechanical pan, twist, tilt, and click functionality, thereby increasing its interaction footprint outside the confounds of its small touch screen. We have also a lot of projects in the realm of mixed and gestural interfaces. So in this is a project of mine called Kneecap, which is a play on mocap in which we have sort of hemispherical mirrors that give mirrors that give the uh, the viewer a view of their whole body and hence we use that view to do a full body digitization including a 3d body pose hands and mouth so you can imagine a final prototype of it which will be much smaller which we have using um using fisheye cameras so we have also ventured into the space of smart environments so in this example of our project synthetic sensors we explore the notion of general purpose sensing wherein a single, highly capable sensor can indirectly monitor a large context without direct instrumentation of all the objects. So as you can see in the top left corner over here, we have our sensory device, um, which is the synthetic sensor basically, and it has a lot of sensors such as uh, actual meters on it um, for sound and acoustic modeling, more microphones and motion sensors and magnometers as well, through which we can um, recognize a of human activities, such as whether the person is using a dishwasher, whether the person is cooking, etc. So, a grand vision that our whole lab has sort of subscribed to is the notion of having intelligent environments and in tools to interact with them. So, as a part of the sensing expedition, we have built up a wide range of modalities, such as using electromagnetic signature or devices in this project called EM Sense or acoustic activity recognition in the wild. We have even used laser-based vibrometry to name another complementary approach of sensing. So tightly coupled with these sensing paradigms is the interface to relay this information back to the user. Creating such interfaces has been a persistent goal of research areas such as ubiquitous computing, augmented reality, and mobile computing. So one way we look at it is by onward projection systems, as you can see in this example called WorldKit, where we have a projector and a depth camera. The depth camera senses where the user's fingers are, and the projector is used to like display augmented reality interfaces into the world itself. So orthogonal to this approach of projecting onto the real world is mobile augmented reality, which opens a new paradigm for human computer interaction. So that is where my work, Light Anchors, focuses on. Augmented reality requires overlay of digital information and interactive content onto everyday scenes and objects. This creates the need for fast and robust in-view anchoring and data transmission. While we expect this transfer of data to be seamless, in reality, it often requires marker tags that are large and pronounced. For example, large QR codes on trains that transmit the schedules or Aruko codes in art galleries to act as fiducial anchors for image overlays. Apart from being visually obtrusive, these tracks can also transmit, can only transmit a fixed data payload. Alternatively, other markerless strategies require pre-registration of scenes and objects, and also do not support the ability to transmit any dynamic information. For example, this is Apple's ARKit object registration process. And you can imagine how time consuming and cumbersome it will be to, for example, tag every object in the real world that you want to sort of recognize with this toolkit. And also it has no way to disambiguate between two same objects. So for example, I have two of these same um, bears, so it will have no way to tell the difference between these two things. So let's look at the things that we ideally want um, in, um, in our system or this ecosystem. Therefore, we require something that 
no pre-registration or special instrumentation of objects is unobtrusive or at least attractive in nature and it can detect many simultaneous objects transmitting simultaneously. It would be great if it could do this in a cloudless manner that requires no mediated handshake between the sender and the receiver. And it should be able to transmit dynamic data payloads. By this, what I mean is if the properties of the thing changes, for example, if it wants to transmit both message A and B, it should have the functionality to change what message it's transmitting based on its current state. And it would be great if it was only a software-only solution that I could ideally download on my smartphone to um, unleash this capability, rather adding some expensive hardware to it that's not found on the device I'm already buying from the market. So in this exploration, what we noticed was that many devices around us have some sort of status lights on them. For example, the smoke alarm mounted to the wall uses these status lights to tell the users about smoke status. Or this power strip on the right relays state information through the LED below its switch. So keep in mind that these devices have no internet, Bluetooth, or any connectivity to the outside world. It would be great if we could give these so-called dumb devices a voice in our digital world in a cheap and cloudless manner. So let's talk about how we can do this. An interesting development that has happened in the recent years is in camera smartphone technology. In recent years, it's come leaps and bounds with high speed cameras now being commoditized. Most of these have the, most of these cameras have the ability to capture videos at 240 frames a second, and many of them can process this, these frames real time as well. Thus, utilizing the pervasiveness of point lights and high speed cameras, we developed light anchors, a new method for displaying spatially anchored data. Unlike most prior tracking methods, which instrument objects with markers, we take advantage of these lights, such as LEDs and light bulbs, for both in-view anchoring and data transmission, as can be seen in this payment terminal example. So for every, in so let's talk about the implementation steps of how light anchors actually works in the real world. So what we do is, the once the camera captures a frame, for every incoming frame of the video, we create an image pyramid, such that lights, big or small, close or far, are guaranteed to be one pixel in size at one level. Our algorithm then searches for light anchors using a max pooling template. That's so what this max pooling template does is it um, produces many candidate anchors that are light in color surrounded by darker material, as you can see in the top right corner image of this template over here. So this produces many candidate anchors, such as the LEDs or buttons on the keypad, which you can see in red over here. So once we have these sort of candidate anchors across different pyramid levels and different frames, what we want to see is the temporal consistency across all of them. So therefore, we track a blinked binary pattern over time and only accept candidates with the correct preamble, after which we can decode the message that they are transmitting. So just to provide a recap, it first, finds bright spots surrounded by darker spots. And once it finds all these certain spots, which are candidate light anchors, it can then track them over time and decode them in real time at 240 hertz to get the message back. So this eliminates a lot of false positives for us, which can be sort of like just normal LED light bulb around the house or like bright reflections um, around different parts of shiny metallic objects. So as high-speed cameras are now becoming common in smartphones, our approach can run at very high frame rates. On the iPhone 10, um, our process runs at 120 FPS, allowing us to detect a 32-bit light anchor in roughly quarter of a second. As you can see in this uh, video over here, which has a conference phone that sort of displays its, um, uh, we evaluate our light anchor system and the study design behind it. So to evaluate the efficacy of our system, we captured data from three environments, namely a workshop, classroom, and an office to simulate three different lighting conditions and effects of ambient lights. And we did this for two motion conditions, in one which we fixed the phone on a tripod, and the second in which a person was walking with the phone across six different measures of distances ranging from two to 12 meters. All the data was captured from two light sizes, a small LED and a larger LED matrix. 
Light anchors achieved a true positive detection rate of 99.6%. That is, our system was meant to be designed for high recall. That is, if there were like 100 light anchors present in a room, our system would detect 99.6 of them. Or like if there were 1,000, it would detect 996 of them, which means that while it had a high false positive rate at this initial detection step, what we wanted to do was capture all light anchors so that hopefully our second step, which checks for the message and the preamble across a temporal consistency window, would then take all these false positives and throw them out. So across all conditions and distances, we found a mean bit error rate of 5.2%, which translates to roughly one error in every 20 bits transmitted. So this level of corruption can typically be handled by error correction techniques. We can see from this graph that light anchors performs much better when there is lower ambient illumination, since it can be better compared to the background and is more distinguishable in such conditions. Across different sizes, we found that the bigger light anchor can be detected from further distance, and therefore has a lower SNR. We also found that the performance is better or when the person is walk, uh, so when the person is still and not walking, because when the person is walking, there's motion blur introduced in that case. So now that we have looked at the system of light anchors and like what it can enable, let's look at a few example use cases um, on how it can be used in the real world. So first and first straightforward is to transmit fixed data. For example, the name of a building and its opening hours, as you can see in this video. More interesting is the ability to encode a small dynamic payload. For example, this power strip reports its life power draw. This glue gun provides its current temperature and use status. And this fire alarm outputs its uh, battery life. So as you can see that most of this information is dynamic in nature and changes with time. So the light anchor can blink and like continuously transfer new information. And because there is no pairing involved, the phone can just point to it and get that information from it. So apart from instrumenting objects with microprocessors, many devices already have these microprocessors inbuilt into it. For example, this router has status LEDs, which are controlled with a microprocessor, and you can blink the status LED to transmit information. For example, imagine walking into, smart, uh, walking into Starbucks, and there is a Wi-Fi router there. You can simply point your phone at it and display, and it displays its SSID and guest Wi-Fi password. You not, do not need any pesky little SSID clips which you have to put on each table. And also it is very privacy preserving and nobody else can steal it since it requires a direct line of sight, even though it's a public Wi-Fi. Another example is a security camera that shares its uh, privacy policy. And it can say, hey, I'm a security camera, I'm recording data, but all the faces are blurred and no audio is being stored. Similarly, a ride shares headlight can emit a unique ID to help passengers find the right vehicle. So in this example, what we did was we instrumented the car's headlight and replaced it to blink with a light anchor. As you can see, it can correctly decode the preamble even though it's in an outdoor setting at night um, and the car is moving. So another way light anchors can be used is to provide connection information. For instance, if we have a thermostat, once the light anchor sends its payload, it can open a connection gateway via Wi-Fi or something else. Now you can have a little app that you can use to control it. As you can see, the user presses the barrows to, uh, to control the thermostat and its temperature in this example. Same for a smart light switch, which could transmit an IP address, allowing smartphones to open up a socket and take control of it. So there is no need for any tedious IoT pairing anymore, in which you can just have a small sort of like a blinking light, and you can just use that to transmit the information which in turn acts as the pairing for the devices itself. So in this way, you have used light anchors to not only just enable AR overlays, but also open a higher throughput channel, which can further be used to send much bigger data, such as Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, but it can act as a connection gateway between the two devices as a pairing starter as well. So, um, so light anchors is live. You can go to this website, anchors.org and you will be able to find the starter code for Arduino. What you can do is just get your own LED, put in an Arduino, blink it, and we have a test flight link to the application that you can send us and download the Light Anchors iOS code 
um, which is pre-compiled, and then you can like sort of point it at the own LED and see it running real time and live. We also have a device spec. We also have a specification for what the light angle standard is and what it pro, uh, what it currently um, presents itself as in the V1 version and our feature iterations of what we want to do with as well. So this paper has been published at a HCI conference called UIST. That is a user interface and software technology conference. So the full video and project details along with the paper PDF is available on this website. Um, with this, I would like to conclude my presentation and uh, open the floor for any questions. Thank you. Okay, so um, Christine, where can I see yes. the question? Hi, right. okay. okay, so no problem, no problem. Um, let's see, I'd like to ask the first question, which is on the subject of um, the current implementation. Um, looks like it, it transmits a 32-bit light anchor. And um, can, you, can you tell us more about that, about where you might go to increase the bit rate so that it's transmitting more information might be useful in, in different use cases? Okay, definitely. So currently, as you can see, like we transmit a 32-bit light anchor. Um, so uh, one thing, one approach that we are thinking about using is a rolling shutter. So for example, like what happens is um, our camera, when it reads this sort of like sensory image is it does not read the whole image together. What it does is it reads the image line by line or row by row. And hence what you can do is encode data in different rows of the image differently and hence increase the bit rate of your system and also faster sampling rates can help with it with an on-device specification. So if you see the V2 on our website, you will see that we are thinking of like going at, um, with rolling shutter, we can now transmit at least two kilobytes of data as well. And we are currently working on that system. So once you have something like that, you can't really just send an IP, but like over a second, you could also send the whole app and it could provide a good AR overlay through this as well. Like not just for, a small payload, but also for a much bigger interface in itself and images. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in your video and demonstrations, you showed a variety of um, the dimensions uh, of different lights, um, like the one on the router and then the headlight in the car. So mm -hmm. what can you tell us about kind of the, the dimensions what, how big or how small can light anchors be to be detected? So that's a great question. So, um, so the different dimensions of like the sizes depends on like how far you are. So we can capture currently light anchors that are even an LED size from at least 12 meters far. So even if it's like a light on a thermostat, it can work from roughly apart from 10 to like a light of this size can work from at least 10 meters far as well because our cameras are able to capture now at 4K resolution as well, um, and at very HD resolution, so still we can get that pixel response at up to 10 meters. And mm -hmm. if the light is big enough, it can go up to like many, many more, 10 times more if the light is of like sufficient size, such as a street light or such things. A lighthouse on the edge of the ocean. Or yes, pretty <laughs> Just... much, yeah. <laughs> we did try also like um, another thing is that um, we have like, some sort of like street lights uh, and some lights on top of our building. What we did was we instrumented it with light anchors just and added a pollution monitor on top of it so it could, could measure air quality and from the next building sort of you could just point at it and like see what the air quality was. And that also worked, for example. Mm -hmm. So in all of your demonstrations, uh, the person is using an iPhone. Yes. Uh, has this been implemented in the, any other devices? So currently we have it implemented in the iOS form factor just because iOS gives us a very good paradigm to use sort of the sensory feeds and it's pretty fast with its on-chip board. But all of this code is only in like a CPU based. It does not require any GPU. So since it's all written in C and in CPU um, and runs on a CPU, on a, that also a single threaded CPU, it can be run on any Android device or even an RPI if needed or much more embedded devices which are resource constrained. So okay. yes, definitely a possibility of use. All right. So yeah, there's a lot, a lot of uh, uh, op well, 
that brings us to a really important question to ask. What's the staff property? Are you going to be releasing this by open source or gonna, is it going to be a commercial um, release? How will people be able to implement this into other devices or into their apps? Mm -hmm. So currently the situation with the IP is that we are giving a demo starter code for almost all the community and for academic community, for example, it is, I think we are currently giving it out the source code also for free use. And with the respect to the IP, currently the way that it's going forward is if you have, if you're interested in the IP, you can mail me or CMU, the tech transfer team at CMU, and they can like figure out an arrangement on how you can like use it to use it in your products. And while we are working on efforts to open source it, we do not know at this time how will they look like and in what license they will be. So I think the best way to like sort of integrate it or use it in your, for example, for any company specific use cases is the best way and the quickest way to move forward is to mail CMU and a tech transfer team there. You can mail okay. me and I can transfer you to them. Okay. So um, it's free to non-commercial academic users and uh, terms to be negotiated for commercial implementations. Yes. Okay. Yes. A couple of other questions um, about your implementation. Uh, someone asks, can you use a road cat's eye as a light anchor? I don't know what a cat's eye is, but... Um, Me neither. Like, what is a... I can Google it, I guess. A road what? Cat's eye. C-A-T-S-E-Y-E. Um, maybe, maybe it's something we just have in the UK or in other parts of the world, but basically it goes into the road and it ref it's my understanding of a cat's eye. It reflects, it reflects into the sense of road. I think Sean's just... Yes, yes. Actually, yes, you can. You, I mean, like, if you attach a small microprocessor to it, like a very cheap microprocessor and the LED in it, and you blink it, it should be able to work as a light anchor. Basically, anything that has a point light source with a microprocessor should be able to do that. Yeah, I've got people down on the ground uh, figuring out, uh, putting the, the, the microprocessors into the cat's eyes on the road surface. <laughs> I think yeah. that might be a, a little bit ways out. Um, yes. Yeah, that's, that's the thing about IoT. Okay. Yeah, it, it's definitely, there. there is an, uh, an active component you have to put, uh, you have to make that um, the frequency. So one of the other questions, is are you determining uh, the the pose, the six degrees of freedom pose with light anchors, or are you only detecting a 2D position? Okay, that's a great question. So currently we are detecting only the 2D position in this example, but we also like, if you open ARKit, what you can do is query that 2D pose and like use um, the ARKit's um, internal methods for example, which is a slam and other things to track the geometry of objects around it to get the six stop position of it for 3D interfaces as well. In fact, that was Jan's follow-up question. <laughs> so you, you anticipated what he was asking and what he was thinking about. I see, yes, 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 yes. So that is like something we have looked at. The thing is that the iOS version of, um, of the AR kit only lets you open a 60 Hertz feed but like if you're if if someone is wants to do it, there's no reason you can't open that at 240 hertz and do something like 3D computation as well. Hmm. Great. Okay. Um, we don't currently have any other questions, so I think um, I'd like to thank you very much for your contribution, your participation in this webinar. Thank you so much, Karan, and uh, good luck with your. Uh, your research, and um, I hope you'll you'll be very successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. you all for having me. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.